Hello and welcome. This is a book launch live webinar promoting and featuring the book, A Participatory Economy by Robin Hanel, um, just published by AK Press, available online now at akpress.org. Um, uh, and um, we are going to be talking about the book and issues related uh, from discussions in the book. Um, I, my name is Mitchell Stepanchik. I am a part of the Participatory Economy Project online at participatoryeconomy.org. Um, I am also the host of Pep Talk, the Participatory Economy Project's um, podcast. I um, am also going to be the host of this presentation. Thank you for joining us. Um, the uh, schedule of events for ton tonight, um, tonight in the United States, um, and in North America is as follows. Um, I am going to be giving a, some very brief remarks right now. I am going to then hand off uh, the floor to our distinguished guest, Robin Hanel, the author of A Participatory Economy. Um, we have a slideshow that Robin will be walking us through that's gonna be about 25 minutes in length. And then we will open the floor uh, for the remaining, for an hour after, after that, more or less, um, for questions, discussion, and um, any points that people may raise. So uh, with that, let's hand the floor off to our host, or excuse me, our presenter um, and the author of A Participatory Economy, Robin Hanel. Robin? So we're going to use, we're just going to give you some visuals as a helpful way for me to give a brief explanation of what you're going to find in the book. I'm not gonna cover everything that's in the book, but I'm gonna sort of hit highlights and, and give you an overall idea of what you're gonna find there. Um, so any, the title of the book is A Participatory Economy, and it's also the name that we have given to our vision for a desirable alternative to capitalism. When, when people become disgusted with capitalism, um, when anti-capitalists, people who are critical of capitalism say, um, well, what do you want instead? Um, well, that's an important question that needs to be answered. And, and essentially what we're saying here in this book is it needs to have a serious answer that is discussable and concrete so people can evaluate it. And that's what's in the book. This is one of my favorite quotes from John Maynard Keynes, um, arguably the greatest economist of all time. Um, certainly the greatest economy, economist of the 20th century. And he said, he, he said this in the middle of the Great Depression, um, in the middle of the 1930s, when it was very, very clear that something had gone terribly wrong with capitalist economies all over the world. He said, capitalism is not a success. It is not intelligent. It is not beautiful. It is not just. It is not virtuous. And it doesn't deliver the goods. In short, we dislike it. Uh, I think this is a little bit of the royal we. I mean, he was a lord eventually. He became Lord Keynes, I believe. In short, we dislike it, and we are beginning to despise it. But here's the key thing. But when we wonder what to put in its place, we are extremely perplexed. Now, at the time he wrote this, there were people in the world who did not feel they were such, they, they were extremely perplexed. I mean, <clears throat> the Soviet Union had a, an economy that in the 1930s um, was growing at a very, very fast pace. And they felt like, well, we do know what to replace it with. We have replaced it here in the Soviet Union. And later in the century, um, the centrally planned system um, replaced capitalist economies in Eastern Europe after World War II and Cuba adopted the centrally planned system of the Soviet Union. China did for a while too. But what has happened is I think many people have rejoined Keynes in being increasingly disenamored of neoliberal capitalism and capitalism in general. We now have to worry that I mean, I don't think Keynes was particularly worried about the fact that capitalism was destroying the environment to the point that it could endanger all life on earth, which it now is. So we have even more reasons to be discouraged um, and, and dislike the system in place 
pretty much every place in the world. Um, but particularly in the aftermath of the failed experiments to, to build a different alternative economic system of the 20th century, I think that many people are perplexed about, well, what should we replace it to and why should we believe that it's possible to replace it with something that is, that is much, much better? We think, that's, we think that's a perfectly legitimate question for people to be asking. And it requires a serious answer. And this latest book, you know, is our attempt to provide a thoughtful answer to the question that Keynes posed, well, almost a century ago. You want to go to the next slide? Thank you. We very self-consciously decided to sort of start the thinking process by defining exactly what goals we wanted a desirable economy to achieve. Instead of just starting with some sort of analysis of markets or this planning system or that planning system or that system of, you know, of payment, we said, well, doesn't it make sense to sit down first and say, well, what would we like the economy to do? What goals would we like it to achieve? And I'm going to go through these very briefly. And one of the things that we might, you know, that people might want to ask about in Q&A is elaboration on these goals, justification for these definitions of what the goals should be. Are, are these the right goals or are there different goals or, you know, what does this goal mean exactly um, and what does it not mean? But we started with, well, we want the economy to be, to, we want the economy to be characterized by economic self-management. And we define that in a very precise and careful way. What economic self-management means to us is people, different people, should have decision-making say over an economic decision, any and all economic decisions, to the degree that they are affected. If there are economic decisions that affect me more than you, then I get more say. You get some say, perhaps, if it affects you as well. That's essentially what we're talking about. And we believe that that is the way to, at a very broad philosophical level, reconcile democracy. Everybody gets to vote. Everybody has a say. And some appropriate degree of autonomy over different economic activities. That when some groups of people in the economy are far more affected by others, they need to have a degree of autonomy over the decision-making process that is appropriate. So that's, what, that's our first goal. Our second goal is we want the economy to deliver economic justice. And this is something that's been hotly debated, you know, by, by, been hotly debated by many, many people for, you know, for centuries. And it's been hotly debated, particularly by um, anti capitalists and socialists. Well, exactly what does it mean to say that, the pe that people are being rewarded fairly in an economy? And our argument is that economic justice requires reward commensurate with the efforts and personal sacrifices people make in the economy. So if I'm exerting greater effort than somebody else, that entitles me to some extent, to an appropriate extent, to somewhat greater reward. If I'm working in a job where it's dirty or are there some danger associated with it, well, that's, and, if I'm making a greater personal sacrifice of that kind, well, that would entitle me to some greater compensation for that personal sacrifice. But that those would be the two criteria. Those would be the reasons for why some people working in the economy would deserve to have somewhat greater rewards than others. Solidarity. Now, I mean, those are the two main goals that, that, that economists will discuss. And we've added some. Um, we've gone ahead and said, look, 
well, excuse me, there's one other main goal that economists adjust X sometimes to the exclusion of all other goals. But we've added some other goals. And the first one we've added is solidarity. It's possible that the way an economy is organized and run and how decisions are made would undermine people's regard for one another. They'd be basically put in a situation where the only sensible response is to sort of look after their own self-interest, perhaps even, even at the expense of other people. Well, that would undermine what I consider to be the precious amount of solidarity that we as humans have for one another. If possible, wouldn't it be better if an economy would promote concern amongst people for the well-being of others instead of creating incentives for people to disregard the effects of whatever they do on other people? So we, all, we, all of the things being equal, we would like the economy to promote solidarity rather than undermine solidarity. We'd also like the economy to promote diversity. That is a variety of lifestyles and different life outcomes. And the rationale for that is sort of simple. People, people can be very different. People are very different. Their needs, their desires, what kind of life they, the best life for some is very different than the best life for others. And particularly, I think in, in, in light of the history of the centrally planned economies of the 20th century, um, where one of their sort of more obvious failures was to accommodate the need for diversity of outcomes and the diversity of, of opportunities and different kinds of activities for people. Um, I think that's something that looking back on failures of the past, that's something that we need to, to keep very much in mind that we do, that that we want to achieve. Now, efficiency, um, I misspoke before. Efficiency is usually, it can sometimes be the, the, the entire concern that economists have when they're talking about, is this way of doing something or that way of doing something better than that? They look to see, well, <clears throat> is one way efficient and another way inefficient? And without, say, without making efficiency into the be-all and the end-all goal, um, and despite the fact that when many anti-capitalists hear the, hear the word efficiency, what they want to do is scream, hold their ears, and run for the exits, because they're always told that various things have to be this way because it's efficient, when they have good common sense and realize that's not, it's becoming an excuse. I do think it's an important goal, and we would neglect it to our detriment. If we designed an economy that achieved all these other things, but was demonstrably inefficient, I think that would, first of all, I think it's unnecessary. And second of all, I think it would be deeply problematic. I think it would lead to a lot of problems. By efficiency, all we mean is meeting our various goals without wasting our limited time. People only have so many, there's only so many hours in a day that you can do things. Your life is only going to be so long. So wasting people's time is not something that they appreciate, and rightly so. And resources are scarce. Resources are often scarce. And wasting scarce resources and getting less valuable output from the, from the resources we have is something that I think everybody has a right to be to, not to tolerate, not to want to tolerate. So we want the economy to be efficient. And then finally, um, this last goal is increasingly important in the world that we know because capitalist economies in a rather short period of historic time, a couple of hundred years, have taken us to a situation where we're on the brink. We are on the brink, maybe a decade or two decades away of damaging the natural environment to the extent, particularly generating climate change, to the extent that we will render this planet far less humanly habitable, you know, than it has been during the entire life of our species. So this is an urgent requirement. And I'd also like to say that I think this is a, this coming to environmental awareness is something that leftists and socialists um, need to make amends for. Um, and I, I will say for myself that I was a Johnny come lately 
to environmental awareness. Um, for the early part of my career as an economist, I focused on the traditional kinds of things that, that socialists and economists focused on, and that was not um, really paying as careful attention to environmental issues as I should have. But, but I've both personally for the last 20 years since I've started teaching in environmental economics classes um, and published in environment, you know, environmental economics journals, and in terms of certain additions and changes that I'm gonna be happy to talk about, particularly in Q&A. We have gone ahead and, and, made some, and made some modifications in our proposals that are specifically designed to make sure that a participatory economy would be the kind of economy that would promote protection and nurturing of the natural environment so that future generations can enjoy benefits as greater, greater than those we enjoy today. Okay, so this is just an overview of the major institutions that I'm gonna elaborate on a little bit. Um, our proposal is social ownership. It's certainly not private ownership of the means of production, um, the factories, the technologies, um, the land, the resources. These are all productive resources. And in a capitalist economy, one of the hallmarks of a capitalist economy is they are all privately owned. And that gives rise to all sorts of problems. Um, and so we propose something that is similar to it. It's very similar to a traditional socialist sort of proposal or, or demand or part of the vision, which is, no, the productive capabilities of the economy belong to all of us, no more to any of us than any of the other. And we have to decide how to allocate user rights over those. But everybody has a right to have, has a, in principle, everybody has a right to bid for user rights over the productive, the productive, the means of production in the economy. Um, so one of our proposals is yes, it's, 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 it's more expansive and I can elaborate on the ways in which I think we've learned what it means. It's not state ownership. Um, and that's something we can talk about if you want to. But in any case, the second major feature are democratic worker councils and democratic consumer councils. So a worker council is simply any place that work is being done, whether it's a farm, a factory, a shop, an office, anything you would simply call a business. Um, everybody who works there is a member of the workers' council for that workplace, and everybody who works there has one vote. Ultimately, everybody who works there has an equal vote over anything that worker council decides that it's going to do. Consumer councils, what we've proposed is that if you're in a city, you're going to have neighborhoods that would, you, you have traditional neighborhoods, and those traditional neighborhoods would have maybe two, 3,000 households that live in them. If you think in environmental terms, if I, I live in Portland, Oregon, and way back early in the 20th century, some landscape architectures were invited into Portland to sort of advise the city um, the, the, the sort of city elders, um, basically the powers to be about, well, what should they do about, you know, city planning? And the thing they recommended above all else was you want to create a park um, in every neighborhood that's a walkable distance. So I'm talking about neighborhoods like that, sort of with that many households in them. And those are neighborhood councils, which are also consumer councils. They are gonna take responsibility for consume, uh, for gathering the consumer requests of the various households and submitting those requests at, during, the, during the planning procedures. A third feature of our proposal or a third institution is we recommend that jobs should be balanced for both empowerment and desirability. Most jobs in a capitalist economy, 
um, do not empower the people who carry out the tasks in those jobs to be to have more knowledge and information about the business and the issues it faces and what things have to be decided. And then a relatively few jobs in a capitalist economy, in a capitalist firm, there are a relatively small number or fraction of the people that are working there um, who are spending pretty much all day, every day, thinking through various options, analyzing different things that, you know, changes that might be made in, the, in, in, in how the place operates. Well, in a situation like that, we can have one person, one vote in the worker council. But what they discovered, actually, this is an interesting thing we can talk about in Q&A also. What they discovered in Yugoslavia, when Yugoslavia set up what they called, you know, a worker self-managed model of market socialism, which functioned for 20 years and in many ways functioned very well. But one way in which it did not function well was as time went on, the participation rates of ordinary workers in, in, in enterprise meetings and decision-making atrophy. And I think the reason is very obvious. If you're doing rote tasks that do not empower you to have information and knowledge about various issues in the firm, then what's the sense in, in participating in decision-making? Just leave it to the people that are that have that kind of information and knowledge. So we don't want economic democracy to atrophy inside workers' councils. And we think that, that therefore you have to take the preventive mechanism of reorganizing work so that as, as, as much as possible, everybody's job would have some tasks that tend to empower them about the, 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 the workplaces affairs. And another question you can ask yourself is, well, why is it fair if some people's jobs are a lot more or less desirable than other people's jobs? Um, and if the answer is there's not, that's not fair, well, then there's two, there's two remedies. And we basically recommend both remedies. And we recommend that that these remedies be ones that are chosen according to the people and individual worker councils as they choose. One remedy is you wanna balance jobs to include some undesirable tasks in everybody's job. If there's gonna be undesirable tasks, somebody has to perform and some more desirable tasks in everybody's job description. You wanna try and balance jobs for desirability as well as empowerment. The other alternative is compensate people who perform less desirable jobs with less desirable tasks to a greater degree for the greater sacrifice that they are making. So that brings us to the next point. Our recommendation is that compensation should be based on people's efforts. Any differential efforts should be taken into account. On people's sacrifices, differential sacrifices should be taken into account. Who's going to decide about all this? Our recommendation is for better or worse, there's no better system than to have people have the, the people in these worker councils set up whatever procedures they are the most comfortable with. And then follow, I mean, it, 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 but we also recognize that to some extent, compensation needs to base, be based on need as well. That there are situations where people have needs I mean, first of all, there's going to be lots of people in any economy who aren't even workers. There's going to be the young, there's going to be the retired, there's going to be the disabled. So, and there's going to be situations where even people who are workers, um, compensating them simply according to their efforts and sacrifices, just it's not humane given the fact that they have come into some circumstance where they have special needs that need to be taken into account. Now, the final major institutions are three different participatory planning procedures, an annual participatory planning procedure that literally replaces markets entirely, and an investment planning procedure that in some ways is gonna be separate from and different from the annual participatory planning procedure, and then 
at least three different kinds of long run development planning procedures. Um, a long run development planning procedure for educational planning, a long run development planning procedure for environmental planning and a long run development planning procedure for strategic international economic planning. And what I'm now gonna do is sort of in the rest of this introduction, just flesh some of all this out for you. But essentially what the book does is discuss this at some length. Let's go ahead. But before I do that, this is just sort of, this is worth thinking about. Um, well, what are the history and origins of this idea? Well, one, one thing is very simple to explain. Um, I mean, we started to present this idea, we being Michael Albert and myself, um, back in two, public, in two books we published back in 1991. So the, our early thinking about this, sort of a concrete alternative to capitalism, we published two books in 1991 that contain many of the features. Is there any place in history where anything resembling what we're talking about has actually been put into practice? Because that's always very useful. If something's been tried, then we have some evidence of what's worked, what hasn't worked, et cetera. I mean, certainly central planning before it had been tried, nobody could be sure what its strengths and weaknesses would be. But in my opinion, after you know more than a you know more than a century, more than more than half a century of trying central 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 planning in a, in a whole host of countries we came to learn things that we wouldn't necessarily have known in advance about some of it, uh, about its undesirable characteristics. Well, there are two places where for short periods of time, the economies operated in some way that is similar to the kind of sort of proposals we're making. One was in the very early years after the Russian revolution, after the czar was overthrown, um, from roughly 1917 to 1921, there were factory committees where workers were deciding what to produce and how to produce it. There was, were, were attempts to coordinate the workplaces, you know, in the kinds of ways that we are proposing. So in the very early years of the Russian Revolution, it also coincided with a period when there were, there, I mean, everybody remembers that the Bolsheviks won the infighting. That's who ended up on top very soon, you know, after the Russian Revolution. But there were many other revolutionary groups, in some ways at the beginning of the revolution, even larger and stronger than the Bolsheviks. And many libertarian socialists, and they called themselves anarchist groups, were very active in the Russian Revolution, and they played a role in creating the kind of economy that they had envisioned. The other place that's perhaps even a better example of where this kind of economic system was practiced, at least for a short period of time, was in, 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 in Spain um, during the Spanish Revolution of 1936 to 1939. So in the Republican parts of Spain during the Spanish Civil War, in cities like Barcelona, Valencia, um, where the Republicans were in control, they implemented an economic system very inspired by libertarian and anarchist socialists um, that operated for a period of three or four years. Um, Noam Chomsky's written very, I mean, quite a few years ago, um, Noam Chomsky wrote very persuasively about whether the popular impression that the economies that the, that the, the, the libertarian socialists operated in Spain during this time period were ineffectual and failures, whether there's any reason to believe that that's actually historically accurate. So I'd recommend Chomsky on the subject of evidence to the effect that the economies operated remarkably well during very difficult wartime circumstances. Um, the other places that you could look for, well, is there anything going on in the real world um, that resembles anything like what we're talking about? Well, one of the things that many socialists in Latin America have come to embrace, you know, in the 21st century is they talk about 21st century socialism. 
And what they mean by that is something that is qualitatively different from the socialism, you know, of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe of the 20th century. And they talk about it as something that is not bureaucratic planning. They talk it as something as something that is consistent with and fully embraces democracy in the political sphere of social life. Um, and we have examples. I mean, in, in, in the early years of the Chavez administration, um, they went about trying to build something um, that was quite different from the socialism of the 20th centuries. They literally told the Cubans, we do not want to you. We, we have no interest in, 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 in adopting your planning procedures. We see that as, as much as we admire your opposition to U.S. imperialism in Latin America, um, and as much as we admire your egalitarianism in Europe, we, we don't see your economy as a successful example that we want to imitate. We want something that is far more democratic, that allows for far more popular participation in economic decision making. That was a very self-conscious goal that they had in mind. Now, they haven't achieved it. Um, and things have become much more difficult. But at least in the early years, that was something that um, it was clearly something that was thinking along, it was thinking in the direction, at least I believe in the direction of the kind of thing, kind of thing that we're proposing. And then finally, I mean, worker cooperatives and consumer cooperatives have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. They are often part of what people envision as being the core of a desirable economy, a non-capitalist economy. Um, so that's another place where you can see, well, where is it that these kinds of ideas have resonated in real life? Well, certainly in worker and consumer cooperatives they have. So a little more in particular. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about workers' councils and I'll try and be a little more economical in terms of being brief. So here are the major points. Self-governing worker councils, one member, one vote. And that's something that not everybody proposing alternatives to capitalism. Um, in, some, in, in some ways, we're an outlier on that. Um, so that's something that I'd be happy to talk about, you know, the whys and the wherefores and Q&A. As I mentioned before, that inside these workers' councils, we recommend that the people, that, that the workers in each council go about trying to balance jobs for empowerment and desirability um, as they see is fit and appropriate. And then we also recommend that what the workers in a council do is attempt to account for any differences in effort and sacrifice amongst their members and award pay in accord with any differences in sacrifices and efforts as, as they have judged. Next slide. Okay, workers' councils are something that is, is more or less familiar to, to a lot of people who've thought about post-capitalist economies. Neighborhood consumer councils are are somewhat different. Um, it's a much more, org I mean, when you think about consumers and market economies, well, they're just individual consumers and they go out and buy. And instead we have neighborhood consumer councils basically representing the interests of consumers in our various planning procedures. <clears throat> so what goes on in a neighborhood consumer council? Well, first of all, they're households. And households are going to make personal consumption proposals. What are, the, what are the personal consumption things that we want during a year? Neighborhoods, like a whole neighborhood consumer council, is also going to need to ask for what economists would call a local public good. Um, sidewalks. We, want to, we, we need to repair the sidewalks. We need to put, um, we have a park, but some of our playground equipment is breaking down. So the Neighborhood Consumer Council would also, as part of its consumption requests, include these what I call local public goods, along with the individual personal consumption requests from, from the different households in the neighborhood. 
The Neighborhood Consumer Council would also send delegates to federations of consumer councils, and those federations would make proposals for higher level public goods, um, a public transit system for the city. Um, that would be an example. No, neighborhood individual neighborhoods don't make a request for repairs to public transit. It's the federation of neighborhoods in a city that would make a request for either building a new line, building a new mass transit line out or making repairs or something along those lines. The critical question is going to be when is consumption socially responsible? We have people proposing what they want to consume. Well, we're going to have to have some sort of way of figuring out whether proposals that people are making, um, whether for individual consumption or, or public goods, whether or not their proposal is socially responsible. And basically, we argue that what that comes down to is, when is the social cost of production not greater than the fair income that those consumers have? Okay, next slide. Um, this slide just sort of reminds you that at the very local level, you have the neighborhood consumption councils, then actually there might be a line in between local and city where, where you'd have federations of all the wards, all the neighborhoods in a ward. Then you'd have a city federation of neighborhood consumption councils, a regional and finally a national um, federation of all consumer councils. Because there are some public goods that are basically consumed at the level of everybody in the nation. Next slide. Okay. This is where things get a little more economic-y. Um, there's really three different ways that you could coordinate all of the production operations and consumption operations that go on in any modern economy. The one that is most familiar to all of us is markets. One that was practiced for decades and decades and decades, um, which I do not recommend. Um, and don't think that we who are opposed to neoliberal capitalism should be recommending in the 21st century was a system of central planning. You can also coordinate the efforts of all the workplaces and consumption through a system of central planning. Those red X's mean we're not proposing either of those. We're proposing democratic planning and a a particularly participatory form of democratic planning. Because there are others out there who've proposed alternatives to capitalism that are also democratic planning. And what distinguishes us in large part from them is how they propose that democratic planning be organized and function and how we propose. And the word participatory is intended to convey the, the message that we are self-consciously attempting to make our form of democratic one in which participation is more vibrant and decision making our our decision making procedures better a better proportion decision making power and authority according to the different degrees to which people are affected by decisions okay next slide so I'm gonna very briefly describe how the participatory annual planning procedure works. And I'm not gonna include some important things. Um, what I'm basically describing was our initial proposal before we incorporated particular procedures that, must, uh, that we have appended that are designed to address environmental issues that we did not, that we did not address initially. But the basic idea is really rather simple. The first step is that some agency, call it the Iteration Facilitation Board, it's a particularly poorly chosen label, um, but in any case, something called the Iteration Facilitation Board is going to announce whatever the current estimates are of the social costs and opportunity costs, the social cost of producing something the opportunity cost of using an hour of electric electrician's labor, the opportunity cost of using an acre of fertile bottom land. So the social cost of producing things, the opportunity cost of using different kinds of labor and resources, 
and the estimates of the social benefits that would come from producing different things. So the Iteration Fertilization Board announces these current estimates. Then what happens? Every consumer council and all federations of consumer councils propose what goods and services they wish to consume. They look at those, at those estimates of costs and those estimates of benefits, and they propose what they want to consume. Worker councils and federations propose what goods and services they want to produce and ask for the various inputs that they say they will need to do that. The third step now, in the in the initial rounds of our planning procedure, those that the first proposals that come in, they are not going to yield a feasible plan. There's going to be excess demands for some things and excess supplies for other things. Well, how are we going to go from the initial proposals that don't give us a plan that could be carried out? How do we go to one that could is that is what economists call a feasible plan that could actually be carried out? And the answer is, oh, there has to be another round of proposals. Well, why won't the proposals just be the same? Because now everybody is responding to adjusted signals about what the opportunity and social costs are. What the IFB does is it updates these indicative prices up or down in proportion to the degree of excess demand or supply. So if in the last round of planning, there was excess demand for shirts, well, the indicative, the, the, the indicative, the, the iteration facilitation board now adjusts the indicative price of shirts in an upward direction. If there's excess supply of a certain category of labor, well, then the Iteration Facilitation Board adjusts the opportunity cost of using that category of labor in a downward direction. Go ahead, next slide. This is just sort of a, 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 a picture to give you some idea of what this sort of looks like or would look like. So in the middle, you have the Iteration Facilitation Board, and it's sending out initial and new prices in every round. And the workers are looking at those new prices and they're formulating new proposals of, now that's each individual worker council is making its own proposal of what they want to produce and what they're asking for permission to receive from others, the inputs they need to produce that. And over here on this side, the same thing is going on between the Iteration Facilitation Board and consumer councils, our neighborhood consumer councils. As, as consumers are being quoted different opportunity and social costs, then they are going to go ahead and adjust what it is they ask for. Next slide. How do the proposals get approved? In central planning, the proposals are ultimately approved or disapproved by the central planning agency. Now that's not what we propose. Well, then who's going to approve or disapprove proposals? All the councils are going to vote yes or no on all the proposals that have come in from the other councils. They basically have to ask themselves, are production proposals coming from other councils socially responsible? Are they using scarce productive resources efficiently or are they wasteful? They have to ask, are consumption proposals socially responsible? In other words, are they fair? Are these, is the Neighborhood Consumer Council asking to consume more than all of the effort ratings, you know, or what basically becomes their income would allow them to have? Now, the key question is, how are councils supposed to know this? Well, it's really rather simple. For a consumer council proposal, all you have to do is multiply the quantity of every good or service requested by the current estimate of its social cost, and then compare that to the average effort rating of the consumer council that's asking for that. And if the average effort rating says, yes, they're not asking for anything more than is fair for them to ask for, then of course, thumbs up, we approve your proposal. The rest of us all approve your proposal. How about for workers' councils? Well, all that has to happen is all you have to do is compare the estimate 
the estimated social benefits of the outputs that it is proposing to, pr to produce and provide to the estimated social cost of the inputs that they are asking. And if the social benefits of their outputs exceed the social costs of the inputs, we're all better off if they do what they just asked to do. Thumbs up. Only if they are not proposing to generate as much social benefits as the social cost of the inputs they're using, only then might the rest of us have some reason to object and vote thumbs down. Next slide. So let me just sort of summarize, because the, the, the annual participatory planning procedure is very, very unique in the literature. I mean, it is probably, there, there are various proposals that have been made over the past 30 or 40 years. And, and this is, and, and ours is probably one of the most unusual. So first of all, it's a social iterative process. So at some point at the beginning of December, the indicative prices are announced and there's a first round. And then the indicative prices are adjusted and there's a second round. And that goes on until we have a feasible plan. And basically what we've done is we've worked out under what assumptions in theory would this feasible plan be something that's efficient um, and proved under what circumstances it would. And the answer is it looks in theory, it would be more efficient than you know when market seeking meets a market economy meets meet its meet their equilibrium, which they never do, and they're always more efficient because they're not in equilibrium. And it would be more efficient than centrally planned economies. Councils learn how their choices affect others and can easily see if proposals are socially responsible. So there's both a learning process. When you make a proposal, you don't know how that proposal might affect others. Well, part of what you're learning in the planning procedure is how what you want to do is going to impact what other people can and can't do. Um, and very specifically, what you're going to learn is you're going to be able to see whether your proposals are socially responsible, and you're going to be able to easily see whether everybody else's social proposals are socially responsible. Now, we can talk about, and this is an important thing to talk about, don't the numbers sometimes lie? Isn't it possible that a proposal is being made which is socially responsible, but it just looks like it isn't? Well, yes. In some cases, that's the case. We have to talk about, about appeal procedures. We have to think about how much time we should put into appeal procedures. But essentially, we're making a proposal that we think is eminently feasible. And we could even talk about how simulations of, of annual planning, you know, to our surprise, quite frankly, um, indicate that we would only require a very few number of iterations, something that could easily be done, you know, in the month of December every year. Another important thing is that, that not in our early versions, but in our latest publications, we have proposed ways in which the social cost of pollution gets accounted for in the estimates of the social and the opportunity costs of producing different things. If producing something takes scarce resources, well, that's a social cost. If it takes, if it takes labor time, that's a social cost. Well, if it also either damages the environment or uses up scarce environmental resources, that's a social cost. So all of that, we, we've also now proposed ways to take those costs of pollution into account in the signaling mechanisms during annual planning. And then finally, we believe that our proposal puts collective consumption on the same footing with individual consumption. I think one of the great problems, one of the great um, defects of market economies is it makes individual consumption very easy and it makes collective consumption very cumbersome and very difficult. As a result, market economies engage in much too much individual consumption and we end up with way, way less social consumption or collective consumption that then actually makes any sense given people's desires and preferences. So one of the things we've tried to do, and that's, and, and that's the purpose of having the federations of consumers participate on an equal footing with the individual neighborhood councils when proposals are being made. It's no more difficult in our procedure 
to express your desires and preferences for collective consumption than it is to express your desires and preferences for individual consumption. Next slide. Okay, we're nearing the end. Um, originally, for the first 20 years that we were talking about this proposal, we made some general kinds of comments about what we thought would need to be important features of investment planning and long-term development planning. But we never had made any concrete proposals. Um, and we've now done that. Um, and you'll find them in the participatory economy book and, you'll, and, and, and they're also included in the in democratic economic planning. That's a book that was, that was oriented more toward professional economists. First of all, there are some extra problems that rise when you're doing planning for the future, not just planning for this year. So unlike when we do participatory annual planning, when we plan for the future, the first problem is future generations cannot be present when investment and development plans must be created and agreed to. Now ask yourself, are future generations going to be affected by the investment plans we make today, by the long run development plans we make today? Well, of course they are. If we invest less, people in the future will have less. So they're affected, but obviously unborn generations who will be affected can't be present when we draw up investment and development plans. So that's the first problem that planning over longer time periods faces that planning for just next year, coordinating all the production and consumption going on in the next year doesn't face. The second problem is <clears throat> workers aren't going to know for sure what new technologies will become available over future years. I mean, they can make guesses about it and they might have some ideas, nor are consumers going to know how their preferences might change. They might have some ideas about that, but they're not going to know for sure. And consequently, mistakes are going to be made. So here are two sort of very new problems that investment and development planning faces that annual planning did not. Next slide. And I know this is, I mean, this is trying to jam a lot of answer into a very short time. But here I'm going to just give you the, the most essential ways that we have now proposed to address these special problems that developing for, that, that planning for the future, particularly long run planning face. Our first proposal is to have a national vote on something we call a generational equity constraint. This generational equity constraint is going to limit how much aggregate consumption can differ between any two years. So there's going to have to be a vote on that. What this basically does, we argue, and we're very anxious to hear what other people think on this, because we haven't gotten feedback on some of the most recent proposals. We think this is going to give the present generation, we've tried to create an incentive for the present generation to act as honest brokers for future generation and to weigh the interests of future generations against their own. Because if they vote for a very slight degree to which, in, to which aggregate consumption can vary from year to year, they protect themselves in the eventuality of some situations arising. And thereby they would also automatically protect future generations. Um, Second thing we've proposed, when calculating an efficient plan over time, we have to carefully consider access to information and motivation when designing which federation should be entrusted to estimate the magnitude of different categories of future benefits and costs. So depending on whether we're thinking about investing in education, investing in environmental protection, investing in expanding infrastructure, um, there are different categories of benefits and there are different categories of costs. And the question becomes, well, who is best suited to have both the information to make the best guesses 
about what those will be and also have a motivation um, to act in the general interest rather than their own, in their own, in their own personal interests. So we very, very carefully analyzed all of the possibilities of who you might designate to come up with estimates um, of these various effects in order to come up with some sort of estimate of what it is that an efficient long run plan would be. And then I think the thing that might be the most important thing that we've, that we've proposed in terms of being innovative is this. As I said in the, in the previous slide, there's no way that mistakes won't be made. So when you draw up these investment plans, you're lacking, not, you're lacking information, you're guessing, you're gonna guess wrong sometimes, and that, that means the plan you come up with is not gonna be the most efficient plan. But what if there was a way, what if there was a way to identify when it is that the initial plan had made a mistake and then go about at least correcting the rest of the plan for the rest of the time period the plan covers? Well, it turns out there is. And we've spelled that out in a great deal of detail. Um, how would results of subsequent annual plans provide evidence that some of the assumptions of the initial investment plan were actually in error, that some estimate of technological change was wrong, that some estimate of some consumer preferences of consumers were wrong. How will we discover that during annual planning? And then how can we use what we've discovered to go back and modify those longer term plans to at least meet, to at least mitigate the welfare losses that would occur if we, if we never went about modifying them. So those are really a lot of things that are new for the first time in, in, in the two new books that have come out over the last couple of years. Um, and as I said, I admit that those parts of our recommendations have not been nearly as well vetted, discussed, and debated as many other parts. Last slide. And I think that is the last slide. Um, so you can find out more by visiting the Participatory Economy website, um, and there is our, our wonderful logo. Thank you, Robin. I'm going to stop the share now, and I will now activate. It looks like we have some questions that have come into the Q&A. Um, let me read. Uh, Carmel writes, first off, I'd like to thank you for providing this webinar. Uh, the timing for my business partner and friend and I are very interested in learning more about participatory economies. We're in the very early stages of developing a functioning, sustainably developed farm, food forest, and bed and breakfast with the most ecological and sustainable design affordable, which will provide a safe place for people who have felt marginalized by society to live, earn a living, find society, and sequestering carbon dioxide to reverse global warming. The farm, called Anomaly Acres, will be located in the Woodstock, New York area. We are hoping for any support, feedback, and funding ideas you may have. And Carmel also poses the question, to what extent have you explored and consulted indigenous people around the world on your approach? Robin? Okay. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you told me, I'm glad you told us that you're, that this will be in Woodstock, New York. My, my first question back to you is, where is this wonderful where is this wonderful thing you know going to be located so now i know that it's going to be in, in woodstock new york um and, and let me also congratulate you on undertaking this effort i think there are various things that people can do um this week we can try and encourage people to vote democratic and not republican um there are many campaigns, you know, for union recognition, you know, at Starbucks. Um, people can organize worker cooperatives, people can organize consumer cooperatives, and people can, you know, try and organize environmentally sustainable agricultural practices, um, you know, and businesses. And the more of that that goes on, the more faithful people, the more faith people will have in the fact that doing things in a different way 
is actually possible. Because one of the things we battle against is sort of the overwhelming sense of the general public that nothing else is really possible. It's always been this way, it'll always be this way. And it's people like you that basically demonstrate that that, that is simply not the case. So I'd like to congratulate you on that. Um, the, I mean, I would encourage you, I, I think you will find um, many of our ideas about a participatory economy. Um, and I think you will find visiting the website you know, where there's a discussion forum, et cetera, um, where you can talk with other people, you know, similar, you know, like yourselves thinking of doing things like what you're doing. I think you'll find that of use and I would encourage you to be there. Um, I think that, I mean, I'd also say that you'd be providing us with the benefit because it always improves the quality of our discussion forum when there are people there saying, well, I'm out there in the real world doing this. And so I have some knowledge about how this works and how this doesn't work and what can and can't be done. Um, so for, for, for our purposes too, I think you can be a benefit to us, you know, if you stay familiar with the website and work and, and visit this and visit the discussion forum. Um, your last question is somewhat different. That was, what was the very last part? Mitch? To what extent have you explored and consulted indigenous people around the world on this approach? Okay. Um, that's a hard question. Um, if you look at our proposal, um, even with the modifications and additions we've made, um, there's no part of it that directly addresses um, sort of the practical concerns of indigenous people and their programs, their campaigns. I mean, I participate and support a lot of indigenous campaigns out in the West, you know, but that doesn't mean that a participatory economy in some sense, you know, addresses those needs. Because here what we have is we have a part of the population of a country, um, who were displaced, um, either killed or, or sent to reservations. Um, there are tremendous historical injustices, you know, that we are now fighting to acknowledge and, and, and demanding that there's be some form of, of compensation. I mean, there's a huge debate about whether or not the focus should be on reparations or whether it should be on access to resources going forward. Um, and that's an important thing. And I, I, I don't claim to have any particular expertise or, you know, in that area compared to many others, you know, who work in those campaigns first and foremost and full time. The only other thing I would say is that, um, and I think uh, in the chapter, I mentioned before that we propose social ownership and, and that it's different from state ownership and that it means more than just the machines in the factories don't belong to private owners. Um, and I give a number of examples of how it is that indigenous societies in the United States approach the issue of ownership in ways that we should take seriously to heart. And if you take a look, I mean, uh, I live in, 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 in Oregon, which is in the Northwest, and there's a very sad history of the displacement of the indigenous here, where the population was very, very, I mean, the indigenous population in this part of the United States was, was it was a very dense population. Um, and they were decimated by disease, even more than by being shot. Um, and they were displaced rather rapidly. But there was a period of time in the late 1800s and early 1900s when the indigenous tried to negotiate with the white man about you know, what it is that they wanted to still have. And their approach to negotiation was, 
they wanted user rights over certain parts of the natural commons at certain seasons. So they wanted to be able to use, they wanted to the treaty to say, well, you can come to this river at this time when the salmon are going through, because that's how they had always worked it out. The different tribes had always sort of worked out who gets access to this part of the natural commons, whether it's for a fishery or it's for growing something or if it's for berry picking. So, I mean, they had worked out who has access to what they needed to reproduce their way of life. They had worked out access to that and the concept of owning land was not part of how they worked it out. For them, nobody owned it. I mean, the whole idea that somebody would own land made no sense to them. Now, for that reason, that was part of the reason the negotiations worked out very poorly. The white man said, well, we want to give you a place that we can shunt you off <laughs> where the resources are so poor, none of the white settlers want it. And we want to give you that. They tried to negotiate for fishing rights on the Columbia River during a certain time of year. Um, so I do think, I do think that that the indigenous the indigenous conception of what it is that we need to decide about access to productive resources in their case, most importantly the natural you know the different components of their natural environment that what we're working out as an answer to the question it's not that anybody owns them. We have to work out. Who should be using them for what purposes when? That's what needs to be negotiated. So I do think that my conception of what common ownership means is something that I have learned tremendously from, you know, studying how it is that indigenous populations in the United States approach that issue. Thank you. Um, Carmel makes a follow-up point, uh, FYI, 80% of the world's most protected land is protected by the remaining 5% of indigenous societies. Um, Carmel poses another question. For annual planning, how would you suggest planning for farms? For example, long-term planning with annual cycles. Robin? Okay. The, I mean, a farm is a production operation, just like a factory. Um, it produces food. How many people are working on the farm? I mean, it can depend. There are farm, maybe it's just, maybe it's a single family. Do we have single family? I mean, in the storied history of the United States, the single family farm, you know, holds this hallowed place in US history. Um, and one of the tragedies is the demise of the family, fam you know, family farm. We now have corporate agriculture. Well, one thing corporate agriculture is, is it's a much larger group of people, you know, that are running the agricultural production process, you know, than a single family. So we are agnostic on what is the appropriate size for different workers councils. So you can have workers councils with very few people in them. You can have workers councils with thousands of people in them. Um, from an economist's point of view, that should depend mostly on whether there's economies of scale or diseconomies of scale. Um, but in any case, so yes, we're going to have farming and a participatory economy. Um, and what farmers are going to do is they're basically going to say, I mean, obviously farmers don't want to be moving, you know, from year to year. But essentially they, 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 will, they will continue to put in bids every year to say, well, one of the things we're asking for permission to continue to use is the land that we've been using. And in some cases, they might say we'd, we'd actually like to have a few more acres or we'd like to have or we no longer want to use all the acres we used last year. We want to use a little fewer acres. So that is part of what's going to go on during annual planning. Um, the presumption would be that they're not really starting from scratch. Um, they essentially have sort of first right of refusal on that. Um, but they're going to be charged according to the opportunity cost of using it when we evaluate whether or not the way they're using it is going to produce at least as much social benefit as social cost. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the system based, the system as I described it works 
for farming activity as well as factory activity, as well as office activity. Now, I mean, one thing I can say is that <laughs> one of the questions that I often get that I often that I always hope I'm not going to get is, well, what about an art? What if I'm an artist? You know, what's going to happen to me in a in a participatory economy if I'm an artist? But if nobody's asked that question, that I that I won't bother trying to answer it. But in some ways, um, I have an easier answer for farming. That in in broad brushstrokes, farming is similar to any any other kind of productive economic activity. It uses more of a certain kind of resource and less of others. Um, and perhaps, and whether or not on average, it's more sensible to have, you know, 20 people engaged in a, in a workers, in a workers, in a workers council that's a farming workers council or have three people in the work, whether on average it's going to be a smaller operation or a larger operation, I'm really not sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. Meg writes, explain how the participatory planning process takes into account negative impacts on the environment in ways that market systems do not. Robin? Okay. Um, okay, if you think about a market, let, let, let's just think briefly about a market economy. So we know that um, when our automobile factories in Detroit are putting sulfur dioxide in the air and the sulfur dioxide drifts over the you know the northeastern part of the united states and it comes down and it causes acid rain and it erodes cars in boston and it makes lakes in the adirondack have no fish in many so this is a negative consequence you know of of producing automobiles in detroit um how could a market system take that into account? Um, well, the, the, the common answer is, well, you want to put a tax on sulfur dioxide emissions. And that's the right answer. And there's a very famous economist who deserves to be credited, you know, as having discovered the answer. His name was Alfred Pigou, and he was the principal economic professor at Cambridge University, no, Oxford University, um, during the early 20s. And he is des deservedly famous for pointing out that if you don't tax those emissions, then there will be an inefficient amount of sulfur dioxide coming out of those stacks. And we will probably be producing too many cars because we're not taking into account how all of the negative consequences of producing a car. Um, so the answer is a tax. But the dilemma is, in a market system, how high should the tax be? We know there should be a tax. How high should it be? Now, I mean, I'm an environmental economist amongst other things, and I teach classes, and I know what people who get degrees in economics who specialize in environmental economics does. And probably 80% of them spend their lives as environmental economists trying to design questionnaires, willingness to pay, willingness to accept damage surveys, to come up with some sort of accurate estimate of how much damage something like that does in a market economy. But the first reaction that I always get from students, and I think it's totally inaccurate, I mean, totally, it, it's a valid reaction. When I explain to them how these willingness to pay and surveys, how they work, they just look at me like, you've got to be kidding. There's no way that it's going to give a very accurate answer. And my answer to that is, well, you're probably right. We do the best we can. We live in a market economy. If we don't do it at all, then we're going to be even farther off. Um, but the problem is all of those estimates that we engage in in real market economies are very susceptible to having somebody come along and say, well, that that's too high or that's too low. And then you just get the political process of those with a vested interest in the tax being lower try and argue one way, et cetera. So what we claim to have done is inserted into the annual pl planning process, a part of the procedure that actually 
would arrive at a fairly accurate estimate of just how much damaging different kinds of pollution are. So they can be included in all of those opportunity cost price signals that we are sending all the decision makers in the economy that, and having them take into account. So what we've included is something we call communities of affected parties. So what I said when I gave the, the very short presentation of how does annual participatory planning proceed, I said, well, there's basically three actors. There are the worker councils, there are the consumer councils, and the iteration facilitation board. Well, we've actually now proposed that there be a fourth group of actors. And that are these, and the, the fourth group are communities of affected parties. So suppose you have a factory and it's generating local pollution. And anybody living within 10 miles of the factory is going to be affected. Well, those people would be eligible to be members of a community of affected parties. And they, we, we are in the planning procedure, we give them to write the right to say how many units of pollutant that is affecting those people is going to be permitted for any of the factories operating in their area. Now, you might ask, well, why wouldn't they just say zero? If they're negatively impacted and you give them the power to say how many units can the factories pollute, well, they're going to say zero and then the factories can't produce anything and then this isn't going to work. Well, here's the incentive for them to say something other than zero. We're going to say they, get, they have the right to say how many units of this pollutant can be released. If they allow some to be released, they're gonna receive extra compensation beyond what they get from being workers, beyond from what they get according to need, because they have some need category. They're gonna get extra income in the form of compensation for having allowed that many units of the pollutant to be released according to the current estimate that the Iteration Facilitation Board has of just how damaging that pollutant is. So, I mean, I've done, I mean, that's as much as I can explain without going into even longer detail, but what we've basically demonstrated is, if you do that, if you set up that procedure, what the victims of pollution, you're basically giving the, the victims of pollution are proposing how much they're gonna allow to go on, but they're being compensated. Anybody who wants to emit the pollutant is going to be charged for doing it just like they're going to be charged for using, you know, the labor of electricians or charged for using an acre of land. They're going to be charged for emitting pollutants. And they're each going to have an incentive to essentially come to a conclusion during the iterations where under the standard assumptions that economists usually make, we have every reason to think that they will come to a reasonably accurate estimate of just how damaging the pollution is. And then that will be taken. And then the important thing is that damage that we now have an accurate estimate for, that all of these willingness to pay studies don't provide accurate estimates of, but we will have one. It's going to be incorporated and included in the cost of making things. And it will therefore influence what we make and how much we make of different things in ways that market economies clearly do very, very poorly since we tremendously over pollute. Thank you, Robin. And thank you, Meg, for the good question. Um, that concludes all the questions that we have in the queue for the moment. And we've got about 10 minutes left in this planned presentation. Um, why don't I ask a question until such time as we get an open question um, before the end of the planned presentation here? Um, Robin, following up on a point that you had made in your presentation with regards to devising an economy that strives to be fair and just, but also mentioning regarding the setup for a worker council, um, where in each member of a worker council uh, gets one vote, regardless their seniority, so that in a worker council, let's say I join and I'm there a week, I get the same vote and voting power that someone who's been there for, say, 10 years. Uh, on the face of it, it would seem that that's not fair. But yet, this is an economy that strives to be fair. So my question to you is, how do you square that circle? 
How do you address that concern? It's an interesting issue. What, on the one hand, you voice the view that, well, why is it fair that somebody who just joined the worker council get the same vote as somebody who's worked there for 10 years or 20 years? And I can, I can hear that and say, well, that's not totally unreasonable. Um, on the other hand, starting today, presumably everybody that's working there is going to be, there's no reason to assume that anybody working there is going to be any more or less affected by what is what it is that's done there than anybody else. Um, I know certain, I mean, I mean, I worked in a steel mill at one point in my life, and I know that, you know, unions, um, unions frequently, I mean, almost always will negotiate contracts where seniority is used, you know, as the criteria for who gets to bid on new, new job openings that come available within a plant. Um, that those with, you know, amongst those who are qualified when an opening happens, who already work there, if those who have greater seniority are going to be given preference. So, there, I mean, there's certainly in our own labor movement history, you know, a sentiment that this is sort of what's fair. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just sort of say, I mean, I personally think there are more advantages too. There's more to the logic that once we're all here, no matter how long any of us have been here, from this point forward, all decisions affect us more or less equally. Or if they don't, it has nothing to do with how long you've already worked here. The 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 greater concern for me is, and and I'll I'll give you an example of this. Um, Pat Devine and um, and his collabor collaborator uh, Fikrid Adaman, they also have a model of democratic planning, um, and they take a very different approach to this. Their approach is it starts with what I do not what I believe is an uncontested fact. It starts with the it starts with the uncontested fact that what the workers in a worker council decide is going to affect people outside the workers council. And so they propose that those other affected constituencies, maybe it's people living in prox, you know, people living in close proximity to the factory. Um, or maybe it's people who are working in workers councils who are producing inputs that this workers council uses. So their proposal is that you give seats on the board of the workers council to these various outside interests. So then it's not, okay. And there's a rationale for that. And the rationale is, well, it is true that people outside the workplace are affected to some extent by decisions made about what the workplace would do. So in some sense, you could say, well, that's the right way to, to put the principle of decision-making power in proportion to your, to your affected into operation. But here's an immediate practical dilemma. How many different groups outside deserve seats? And how many seats do they get? And I don't know any way to have a sensible discussion about that. I don't know other than somebody arguing strongly that this group is somewhat affected and therefore deserves five seats. And somebody says, no, you only deserve two seats or you don't deserve any seats. I don't really know. It just sort of becomes kind of a discussion that has no criteria for sort of knowing what the right answer is. Um, if it were the only way to give people outside a workplace any influence over what's done in that workplace, I would concede, I guess we're just going to have to do that if we want to achieve worker self-management as defined. Um, but there is another way. And the other way is the annual planning procedure. And so I think if you look at it, what the annual planning procedure does is it actually empowers those outside 
to exert their influence over decisions, but not by giving them a vote inside the worker council. So for instance, suppose a worker council makes a proposal where the social benefits of what they're proposing are not nearly as large as the cost of the resources that they're, they're asking permission to use. Well, there is a restraint on them. That has a negative impact on others and the other councils can vote that down and we're gonna give them the information that allows them to do it very quickly. So I think there's a better way to take a care of this. And, and, and here's the other thing I'm gonna say. I think one of the things that we've discovered is human history, I mean, from the time that we've had organized civilized societies and economies, we've basically had a situation where most people are just being told what to do by somebody else, by a king or by a capitalist employer or by the central planning board. So we have this legacy. I mean, why are people going to believe that they really can participate and their participation will be effective? Why are they going to believe that? I think that's a huge obstacle that the history of human economies has left us to overcome in people's minds and expectations. And so I want to, part of overcoming that, I think, is telling people in a workers' council, nobody gets to, you are the only ones to get to vote on your own proposals. And nobody else gets to revise your proposals. Your proposal might be rejected by everybody else on the grounds that they can see that it harms the rest of us more than it helps the rest of it. But nobody else is taking your proposals and saying, oh, we heard what you wanted to do, but that we can't, that can't happen. This is what a central planning board does. That can't happen. And instead, we're now telling you this is what you have to do instead. So I, I just think that part of what we need to understand is the problem that has to be overcome is centuries and centuries of ordinary people not really believing that they're going to be in charge of their own economic destinies. And we need to give the people in a workers' council, they're the only ones that get to decide, you know, on what they propose to do. Others don't get to do that. Thank you, Robin. Um, we are nearly at time, but we have one question that has come in late. So let's ask this. And Robin, if you could probably try to give an answer in maybe a I'll couple give a minutes. Brief answer. And Thank then you. a brief answer, and then we'll wrap up. An anonymous attendee writes in and asks, I have heard about participatory budgeting. What does participatory planning have to do with this? Robin? A short answer. Participatory budgeting is a very interesting phenomena. It's a very interesting idea. It's fairly recent. Um, it originated in two places at the same time that didn't even know they were doing it. It originated in Kerala, India, and it originated in Porto Alegre, the, you know, in Brazil. And it's a very, it's an excellent progressive reform. What it essentially does is it says there's a certain amount of taxes that are collected. And ordinarily, we have a whole process whereby the government decides how to spend the taxes. Guess what? We're going to take a big chunk of those taxes. We're going to take some chunk of those taxes. And we're not going to have them. We're not going to decide how to use them that way. Instead, we're going to tell people in different neighborhoods to organize assemblies and to organize work groups to discuss amongst themselves how they want to spend their part of, our tax, their part of the taxes that have been collected on what sort of local public goods and projects. And I think it's a wonderful idea. And I think it's been very successful when it had good opportunities to operate. And I happen to know that it's, it's actually so successful that even the World Bank is officially in favor of promoting a certain amount of participatory budgeting. Um, it's very similar in some ways to the kind of planning that we propose. And so I also see it as a kind of in the real world experiment to discover how to do this kind of thing, um, to see whether or not our ideas of taking it further need to be modified. 
It's also a way to test it and see how well it does work. It's also a way to build up public support for it when people discover that it does work nicely. Um, so I think it's a very important thing and that probably going forward, um, real world experiments and participatory budgeting are gonna be important parts of moving our economic systems in the right direction in the years ahead. Thank you. Um... And thank oh, you. Sammy. I know that I know that um, yeah. I also know that um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, they actually have implemented part of it. And I know that in the city of Boston, they now have officially the city council and the mayor have officially endorsed a committee to investigate doing it in Boston. Um, in, in certain wards in the city of Chicago, where I live, you have some some uh, wards that actually do some participatory budgeting. Where I used to live in the 40th ward, um, they actually would have uh, they get an allotment of a million dollars U.S. dollars, and um, people would figure out how they would want to divvy that up as far as public works projects. And they would and people would make proposals, and then people would vote on those proposals, and then they would uh, um, uh, spend that money based on what people voted on. Right. So that's and happening the, the, too in Chicago as well. The dilemma is, suppose the amount of money that's that's designated is fairly small. Well, then True. people are going to wait. Well, I mean, it takes time and energy to go to the meetings. It takes time and energy to come up with them. It takes time and energy to vote on the proposals that come out of the meetings. And at some point, if what is at stake is so small in busy, when people have busy lives, people are just trying to survive and therefore enthusiasm for participation will wane when the stakes are very small. And that was one of the reasons that, that the program went into decline in Brazil, that right. you know austerity came in and the stakes got small. But when, when the stakes are large enough, I think the evidence is that people like it and people make really good decisions about it and it works very well. Yeah, in the case of Chicago, we happen to have a good alderman who wants to do a project like that. But if a new alderman gets elected and they don't want to do it, it just doesn't happen. That's right. um, Robin, this book is connected to a book that, I, by way of disclosure, I should say that I had also contributed to a book published last year called Democratic Economic Planning. How is this book, A Participatory Economy, connected to that book, um, if at all? Um, and uh, um, how are yeah? How are the two connected, and um, why write this book? Okay. Um, all right. I mean, the simple answer is that democratic economic planning um, was written primarily for economists. It assumes in in very. It's not a. It's, it's not written entirely for economists. It's not a book that a non-economist should feel, well, I, I, I wouldn't even open this. Most of that book is certainly comprehensible to people who have little, if any, economic training. But there are parts of that book that really are difficult or inaccessible um, to people who don't have economic training. Um, I mean, that book, you know, proves theorems about whether or not our annual participatory planning procedure will converge to a feasible plan and whether there's any reason to believe that the, under what assumptions would that feasible plan also be an optimal plan, a plan that was socially efficient. So proving theorems about planning procedures is something that, you know, requires a certain amount of familiarity, um, both with mathematical and economic training. <coughs> And after writing that book, what I realized is that the audience today for that book, you know, is a rather small audience. But the audience today in today's world, even in the United States, a place that has notoriously, you know, had a, a smaller percentage of the population interested in anything called socialism, um, even in the United States today, the audience for new ideas about socialist alternatives to capitalism in the 21st century is really much, much larger than the audience of people with economic training, um, you know, who might be interested in that. And so that was the reason to write, you know, a second book that was completely accessible to 
um, anybody who is interested in a discussion, a concrete discussion about, you know, procedures, not just wishes about, you know, we'd like our economy to be a wonderful economy. We'd like it to be fair. We'd like it to be democratic. Well, yes. But I mean, in the light of history, we need to be more concrete in our understanding of how do you, what do you have to do in, a, in order to actually achieve those things? What are, the, what are the concrete procedures that we should use? And what are the options? And what are the, and what are the pluses and the minuses of making certain choices about how certain decisions should or shouldn't be made? All of that is something that I think is very important for people who are disenamored and disgusted, increasingly disgusted, you know, with neoliberal capitalism. Um, there's now a growing percentage of the population worldwide that is interested in that. And a participatory economy was designed to be something that is digestible for that audience that doesn't require any particular degree or prior training in economics or any particular economic expertise. Thank you, Robin. Um, we have some questions that have come in. Um, I will read them basically in the order that I have them here. We'll start with Matic, who writes, how would the participatory process handle resource use that are not resources that are not scarce, but would like to be used sparingly because they are not renewable? Or ultimately, how would the planning process handle a democratic decision to limit the amount of, for example, carbon dioxide emissions? Robin? Okay. <clears throat> yes. Um, this is one area. Um, yeah, I'm going to start by sort of by 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 way of an apology. I'm going to apologize for for leftists in general, who I believe many many leftists for many decades were Johnny come late needs to any sort of serious environmental awareness. And I would include myself among them. Um, when I first started thinking about a participatory economy, um, this is the late 1980s and the early 1990s. Um, <clears throat> I was a typical leftist in the sense that I really, you know, was not very well studied in terms of environmental issues, environmental problems. Now, for a variety of reasons, I think I have cured myself from that ill. Um, and now I have, I took on teaching environmental economics, you know, at American University almost 30 years ago now, and have been teaching it and studying it and publishing in that area ever since. Um, but I do think that this was a major failing of the 20th century left. Was a mailing, of course, it was a major failing of society at large and governments, but it was also a major failing of the 20th century left. Um, so I do think that it, <clears throat> our proposals in these regards are therefore relatively new. We didn't say much on these subjects that you're asking about um, in publications about participatory economy and the model and the procedures, you know, back in the 1990s, you know, up into the early 2000s. But these two new books really do correct that. But they correct it in the following way. If you're, if you're proposing something for the first time, well, then there has to be time. It, it hasn't been vetted yet. There hasn't been time for people to react and respond and say, well, this makes sense to me. That doesn't make sense to me. And there's a lot of other parts of our proposal that have been out there for decades that have received that kind of sort of vetting and we have had a chance to respond to it and make adjustments. Um, whereas the proposals in the environmental area, I'm just saying in advance, are proposals that we're making that are relatively new and we're anxiously waiting, you know, for people to respond to whether they think these proposals are sufficient, are sensible, or need to be adjusted in some sort of way. Um, <clears throat> but the basic answer to your question is, there's two answers. One is we have very carefully designed, and, and this is something that we had to add. When we first published our proposal about doing annual participatory planning, we did not have features of that process that were designed to generate, um, to generate estimates 
that included the environmental damage that different production and consumption activities would generate. But we now have gone ahead and included in our annual planning procedures things that are designed to create as part of the cost of making things, the environmental cost and the environmental damage, that it gets treated just as seriously and is taken just as much account as the cost because it took somebody's, you know, seven hours of somebody's work time that wasn't very pleasant. Well, that's one cost of making things, but any damage to the environment is another cost of making different things. So in annual planning, we now in our annual planning procedure have very specific features that are designed to incorporate those costs. That's different from take, uh, doing something to create a long run environmental development plan. But one of the chapters in, in democratic economic planning, an entire chapter is devoted to how would we propose to come up with a long-term environmental development plan? That is, how do we want to modify over decades and centuries the natural environment in ways that preserve its productive potentials, preserve its consumption benefits in the form of national parks and things that we continue to preserve and enjoy, how would we propose that that kind of long-term environmental plan be created? And then all annual planning and all investment planning then has to take place in the context of the decisions that have been made about, you know, by the, the, the long-term environmental plan. So I would just say that, that there's a lot of new material in, in, in a participatory economy. In, in that publication. There's a lot, lot of new material here um, that we are hoping will be useful to people like the, uh, like the person answering this question, you know, who are quite rightly, perhaps first and foremost, concerned with, um, does anybody know how to organize an economy that would not create the kind of environmental crises and potential climate disasters that we are currently facing. Thank you. Uh, next question. This comes from Ferdia, who asks, how does a participatory economy help us to have more free time, more control over our time, and escape the rat race? Robin? Well, that's, I mean, <laughs> It's a good question. And I think that the premise of the question is something that, that I think many people sense about something that is very wrong about our present economic system, that somehow in some sort of ways that are perhaps not that easy to understand, our present economic system seems to lead us to prioritize increasing the, the amount of consumption that we can engage in, you know, more than makes any sense. Once our basic needs and somewhat beyond are met and not prioritizing the importance to human welfare and, you know, of leisure time. So there's a trade-off between sort of consumption and leisure that society has to make. And one of the things I believe that's very, very wrong, you know, particularly with neoliberal capitalism is that it contains powerful incentives and forces that push us in the direction of collectively um, making very, very poor choice between the value to our well-being of more and more consumption as compared to the value of our well-being of having more leisure time. Um, one of my favorite, you know, you know, fellow economists is Juliet Shore, who's written two incredibly well-known books um, about the, the overspent American, um, where she explores essentially what is it about our present economies that, that compels us in the way of making a very poor choice in this regard. Um, and so we've taken this into account and we've tried to design features of a participatory economy that do not induce people, you know, 
to make unwise decisions on their own behalf about how much they want to consume as opposed to how much leisure time they want to take. Um, and I think that's one of the, that, that, that's an interesting, when people are, if you're picking up this book and you're sort of looking for, you know, answers to, to things you've wondered about, I would invite people to look and see, well, have we proposed something that would no longer be plagued by an unfortunate bias, you know, toward more and more consumption at the expense of not only leisure, but also at the expense of the natural environment? Um, next question uh, comes to us from Colm from the Solidarity Economy Association, who asks, what does this book do better or do differently than earlier books on the subject? Robin? Um, well, hopefully, hopefully one learns from sort of further study and, you know, criticisms and responses, you know, that people have, have made. Um, when I go back and look at, um, the first book that Michael Albert and I published back in 1991, um, where it was the first time that we proposed you know, at least some of the features, some sort of, some concrete answers to some of the questions about how a desirable socialist, libertarian socialist economy should be, could be organized and run. Um, <clears throat> when I go back and look at it, sometimes a, a smile comes on my face about, oh my gosh, um, you were naive back then. Um, you didn't even realize that there are all sorts of important questions that you have not yet answered or even proposed answers for because they hadn't even occurred to you. So at this point, you know, we're almost 50 years in to, you know, continuing to work on this project. In particular, so in part, we've changed proposals. Um, we've listened to criticisms and, and agreed. Um, and and in part, what we've done is tackle things that people pointed out. Well, you haven't said anything about. Um, we hadn't said very much. We had said very little about the environment. Um, we had said very little about um, reproductive labor. There's a whole chapter. You know, there there are new chapters in both of the books. The one written primarily for economists and a participatory economy. There's a whole new chapter that is basically the product of joint work um, with two feminist socialist economists also um, about reproductive labor. And as I said before, we had never tackled the issues. We had never tackled really in any serious way other than making sort of some general comments about what, what we wanted investment and development planning. We want, these were the goals we had for it, but we hadn't made specific proposals about how to try to achieve those goals. But this is the first time in this book, in these books, you're gonna find proposals for investment planning, um, long run education planning, long run um, environmental planning, and <clears throat> long run strategic international economic planning. We had really never addressed before the question of, well, what about a country? Well, what if a country adopted, you know, <clears throat> something along the lines of a participatory economy in today's world? How would they go about trading with capitalist countries? How would they go about trading with other countries with, you know, humane or socialist economies? How would they go about trading with less developed economies than they are or more developed economies than they are? Um, would they engage in anything along the lines of strategic international economic planning? And if so, how would they do it? And how would they do it fairly consistent with their own fundamental principles? We really had never said anything on those subjects before. And you will now see some very concrete proposals about how to go about doing all those things that, that were never contained in any of the earlier writings, either articles or, or previous books. Thank you. Um, we have an anonymous attendee who writes a question kind of related to the environmental question that we had asked earlier. Um, the question that this anonymous attendee writes is, given the threat of biosphere collapse, 
Could a participatory economy help us to live within planetary boundaries, for example, carbon emissions? So Robin, um, we live in a finite planet. Can a participatory economy handle that? And how? Well, <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you my very straight answer. We wanted to propose something that would accomplish that. And now we've made a concrete proposal. And we think it does it. And we are waiting to hear back from people who look at it to tell us if they think they agree with us, if they think this does do it, or whether they or whether or not they think it does that we have inadequately done it. I mean, there's two possibilities. Um, I mean, one is um just like anything, um, we know right now that we have totally inadequately protected the national, the, the, the natural environment, you know, in disastrous ways. So we know that we are currently way off in one direction. I mean, it's conceivable that you could design an economic system um, in which people lived less well than they could have because you essentially never allowed any natural resources to be used at all. Now, we don't think that's necessary, and we think we've made a proposal that doesn't make either mistake, but it's clear what mistake humans and human economies have made up until now. I mean, that's very clear. We have way underprotected the natural environment. Uh, <clears throat> so what we, <clears throat> my claim at this point is, We've now put out there something that is our best guess at this point in time about how one could adequately protect the natural environment in a human in an economic system where human well-being can continue to flourish. Um, and we're waiting to hear back from people about you know what they think of the proposals. Now <clears throat> that's different from right now we are. <clears throat> perhaps a decade, if not two decades away from, you know, potential environmental collapse due to climate change. And I think, unfortunately, the, we are not going to replace today's mostly capitalist economies, mostly neoliberal capitalist economies. We're not going to replace them with anything like a participatory economy fast enough so that we can wait for socialist revolution to address climate change. We're gonna to have to address climate change in the here and now. And, 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 our, and in some ways, whether we can successfully do so, even with the albatross of capitalism still hung around the necks of most of the world's economies, if we, can, if we can't succeed in doing that, then there isn't really gonna be much of a plan for participatory economies to come along and flourish yet. So in my mind, one project is, can we now figure out how to run an economy that does not destroy the natural environment? And, I, and we've made proposals in that regard. But of course, the other project that is quite frankly more urgent is, can we prevent cataclysmic climate change from from landing us in a planet that's almost, you know, beyond sensible human habitation, in which case there's no kind of human economy, no matter how well designed, that's going to, that's going to serve, that's, that, that's going to serve humanity. Thank you. Um, and Colm asks another question. He asks, could a participatory economy be tested as a pilot in a real economy at a small scale, or could it only work at a significant scale? Robin? <clears throat> That's a really interesting and, po and you know, interesting question. And, <clears throat> and both I and other people that, that I work with, including Mitchell, um, we've thought about this. Now, <clears throat> one thing that we, what, one thing that we have done, and it took us, you know, decades to actually accomplish. Um, one way to answer that question is, is to try and do a computer simulation of what a participatory planning procedure would be like. 
And we undertook this in order to sort of see whether or not computer simulations shed light on whether or not a planning procedure that in theory under certain assumptions will eventually lead to a feasible, efficient plan. Well, but how long would it take? And how many rounds of proposals and revisions would consumer and, and, and worker councils have to go through? Because if the answer to that is, let's say, 500, well, then is that really a practical possibility? 500 rounds of negotiations to come up with an annual plan every year? Well, maybe it's a great idea in theory, but it's, it's certainly not something that's very useful in practice. So one thing we did was we engaged in computer and the results of those computer simulations, um, which of course we are doing more work on as well, but the results of those, those, those init the initial results of those computer simulations are described and you know, the procedures, the simulations, the results are all described in a rather lengthy chapter that Mitchell is a co-author of in Democratic Economic Planning. And there's a brief summary of those conclusions, including in a, in a participatory economy. Now, that's different from, but in practice, has anybody tried this? And as I said before, um, in history, in the early years of the Soviet, in, in, in the early years of the Russian Revolution, yes, there were worker councils and they were running the industries. Um, in, this, in, in, in Russia, you know, in 1917 and 18, and in the Republican parts of Spain, there were worker and consumer councils and federations that were running the economy, you know, without central planners and without markets, you know, in Republican Spain. But we don't have, unlike the Soviet Union, which was a 50 year experiment in central planning, Unlike market socialism, where there was a 25-year experiment in Yugoslavia that we can study and learn from, there's never been any successful, you know, ultimately successful attempt, you know, to run a, an economy along these lines for any period of time that would give us an answer to the question, well, in the real world, how did it work out? Um, in some ways, Rajava has decided to run its economy and try its, and try and organize its economy under incredibly difficult circumstances along these lines. And so there is something that we can look at there. Um, and the other part of the question is this, well, could we try this? Could, could a city try this? You know, not a whole country. Could a city government, could people be elected to be mayor and the city council in Portland? And could Portland try and do something like this? Well, to some degree, you can do parts of it. Um, and you can see whether those parts work or not. Um, so I do think, yes. I mean, one question is simply this. I mean, we know we, we, we know there's consumer cooperatives and we know there's worker cooperatives. Well, can we imagine that the worker cooperatives and the consumer cooperatives decide to do some planning and coordinating with one another instead of each worker cooperative just engages with all outsiders through the market and each consumer cooperative engages through all through, with all outsiders through the market? And I mean, I've written an article that was published in the Eastern Economic Journal um, suggesting how it is that worker and consumer cooperatives could begin to do some coordinated amongst themselves in ways that would further empower them and also take us in the direction of achieving more goals. I mean, I, I wrote that actually in response to work I was doing in Venezuela during the early Chavez regime. Because in Venezuela, they created a tremendous number of workers' councils very, very rapidly, workers' co-ops. And then they were rather disappointed that those co-ops were simply, you know, relating with everybody through market procedures. And they wanted to know was, could we do something about that? Um, and I was a consultant down there. And when I came back, I thought, yeah, I understand what they want to do. And, you know, maybe there's a way to begin to do that short of, 
you know, adopting the entire participatory planning procedure for the economy as a whole. So these things are, I think, an important part of feeling our way toward the practicality of various ideas. It's also the way that you test the ideas out and discover where it is they need to be modified. Certain things must have, have to be abandoned on the light of experience. So I do think that as part of the road forward, it's not just thinking about them and talking about them, you know, in essays and, you know, and amongst ourselves, it's also, you know, putting some parts of these ideas into practice and getting some more information you know, about the, more information to guide us. Thank you. Next question comes from Elizabeth, who writes, how does the planning process ensure care and investment for the needs of future generations? Robin? That's why you have to do investment planning and development planning. Um, and that's why you need something like, um, well, I mean, I'm really, I'll, I'll, well, you need something like the generational equity constraint. The dilemma, very, very frank, the, the dilemma is when you create investment and long-term economic development plans, a large number of the people who are going to be very affected by those plans, by what those plans decide to do and not to do, are people who cannot be present when you're drawing up the plans those future generations. Well, how do you, how can you enfranchise future generations who aren't even here? I mean, we know how to enfranchise people who are alive. You invite them to the discussion and you give them a vote. It's considered, it, it's a really important intellectual problem to grapple with. How do you, we would like to fully enfranchise future generations. Their interests and their views are just as important as ours. But how do you enfranchise them when you have to make plans now and they cannot be here? And our generational equity constraint is our attempt to do that in a way that can't be perfect because, of course, if they're not here and they are not participating in person, and sort of figuring out ways to induce the present generation to have to take their interests into account. Um, that's what the trick comes down to. And we've proposed certain ways that, I mean, we, we, we've recommended some procedures and tried to argue for why we think it would accomplish this. But I am particularly anxious to hear what kind of response there is out there to whether we have successfully managed to do this or, or, or whether or not there are ways to improve upon our suggestions in this regard. Thank you. That concludes all the questions that people have submitted at the moment. Um, we encourage people to submit in more questions. We have, um, well, we've planned for another 30 minutes for the talk, but while we're waiting for folks to submit in more questions, let me pose um, a, a question to Robin for the moment. You touched briefly on um, education systems with regards to a participatory economy. You talk about it a little bit in the book, but you didn't really elaborate it on it in your presentation, um, nor in anything that you've said now. So I'll pose the question to you now. What do you talk about with regards to educational systems and education in a participatory economy, and how does a participatory economy affect and is affected by education? Okay. Um, I mean, let me just say that we we haven't there's organizations of progressive educators um whose goal is to make proposals you know about how to improve our educational systems um redesigning schools and there's conferences on this subject there's one here in portland every year um amongst progressive minded educators who say look i i'm a teacher um um, or I'm a parent of a student and I'm on the PTA and I'm very, very interested in reforming education. Um, so there are organizations out there and, and nothing we've said is a substitute for that. Um, one of the, one of our, so 
we've never really made a full proposal about educational systems, but we've made we've made both an observation and then we've made some and then we went ahead and made some minimal assumptions about what a desirable education system would look like in order to answer the question, um, how is reproductive labor going to be handled in a participatory economy? So our first observation was this. In most economies to date, in both capitalist economies and centrally planned economies, the great majority of the people in those economies were never going to be allowed to make most of the economic decisions that are made. So in some sense, an educational system in an, an educational system in a society that disenfranchises most workers from economic decision making doesn't have to prepare most workers for economic decision making. As a matter of fact, it almost has to prepare them to accept, you know, their disenfranchised status. So our first observation is, look, if the kind of economy that we're talking about, which is one in which everybody is participating in economic decision making to the degree that they are affected by all the different kinds of economic decisions, well, then we're going to need a much more educationally empowered citizenry in such an economy if it's going to function well. So that was our first observation, that an ec our vision of a desirable, a desirable economy takes as a premise that we're going to have to have an educational system that helps everybody think through things and come to conclusion, analyze, teaches everybody to be able to analyze and think through and come to decisions about what they think is better and worse in complicated situations. So that was our first observation. Um, our second observation is, well, we just have to make some minimal assumptions about what the education system is going to look like. And our minimal assumptions were, well, it's free. Um, it's public education and it's free. Um, we made the assumption that it would be available literally from early after childbirth in terms of childcare. Um, right now, I have a grand, I think Boston Public Schools is the only school system I know in the United States where there are three different grades of school before you get to first grade. There's not just kindergarten, there's basically pre pre-first grade one, pre-first grade two, and pre-first grade three for three-year-old, for three-year, for, for, for three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds. So we are proposing that not only does there have to be public free education, you know, for K through 12, not only should there be free education, that's public education for anything beyond that, um, that at least through 12th grade, and I mean, now we have very sensible proposals coming out of people like Bernie Sanders and people in the United States that, you know, I mean, right now, kids are required to be first grade through 12th grade. Um, we probably need to at least make that through, you know, through two more years of, of community college as just part of our standard curriculum. So we made suggestions along those lines. Um, we don't pretend to be, um, you know, the kind of people who have talked a lot more about um, re-envisioning school itself. Um, but we have talked about educational planning because education is both a consumption good and an investment good. I mean, economists talking about, you know, part of the purpose of education, economists call building human capital making people more productive. Um, so just like we need to, to, we need some sort of system that's gonna figure out how much to invest in, you know, more machinery that makes people more productive. We need some sort of system that is also gonna figure out how much to invest in human edu in education because it makes people more productive. 
But then, of course, education doesn't just make people more productive. You could, an economist would call it a consumption good, um, but it's really more than a consumption good. It's part of preparing people to be able to fully enjoy what human life is capable of. Education is most important function is that function. So we do in our long run development, I mean, there's a whole chapter in democratic economic planning talking about long run educational planning. How, why to do it, how to do it, what to take, what should be taken into account, who is best suited for taking those things into account. It's the first time in the, the, two, the, the two new books are the first time that we've made specific proposals in any of these regards without claiming that it is sort of a full proposal about how to run education in a desirable, in a desirable society. Thank you. Um, I'm, we have a couple of questions that have since come in. Um, Matic asks uh, another question. He, he writes, do you think current participatory budgeting procedures that are run in thousands of cities and in Portugal on a national level could be a seed from which a participatory economy can be germinated? Robin? Yes. I, participatory budgeting, I think, is one of the most interesting sort of innovations that progressives have come up with, um, you know, over the past 20 or 30 years. And there are two places where it was pioneered. And quite interestingly, neither place was aware that it was going on in the other place at the time. In Porto Alegre, Brazil, the Workers' Party, Lula's party, um, they, they won local elections in Porto Alegre and the Workers' Party in the Workers' Party government in Porto Alegre launched what they called a program of participatory budgeting. They set aside a certain rather significant fraction of the city's tax receipts and said, we are going to allow, we are going to tell neighborhoods to create neighborhood assemblies and those neighborhood assemblies should set up task force and committees to come up with what they want to spend their part of the city tax revenue on in terms of public goods and facilities for their neighborhoods. And in Kerala, India, the Communist Party was the party in power also roughly around 2000. And the Communist Party in, 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 in Kerala, India had for decades and decades run on campaigns that were primarily serve the people. We are the Communist Party, we are socialists, and we believe that government and the economy should have programs to serve the people. And a new leader, a new generation of leadership took over control of the Communist Party in Kerala. And they said, you know, it's not just serve the people. We want to empower the people to make their own decisions. And they included as part of their campaign. And they won the election. And part, a big part of their campaign, what they were promising to do, was to launch what they call participatory budgeting. And they did. And I think both those experiments actually were remarkably successful in terms of providing a more efficient and wholesome and full sort of mixture of public goods and involving people quite actively and successfully in making the decisions about exactly how to go about that. Now, the big problem in Brazil, um, what happened was when, when Lula came to power, um, the Workers' Party was sort of committed to this experiment. But what happened was they basically just didn't have the revenues. So participatory budgeting is meaningful if you have a significant, I'll, I'll put it very simply. If there's a big pot of money, then it's worth people's while to go to, to, go to neighborhood assemblies you know, and, and to go through the process of planning on how they want to use it. 
But if the pot of money is so small and insignificant, well, then the experiment can fail because it doesn't elicit very much popular enthusiasm because people quite sensibly realize it's not going to have a big effect on my life because the pot of money that's been allocated and that in my view that was one of the major problems that 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 came into being um in Brazil that even when Lula was elected nationally that budget constraints essentially made it more difficult for them to extend the success in early Porto Alegre you know to every city in Brazil and in the case of Kerala the communists got voted out um, and so that experiment also was put on hiatus, you know, for a number of decades. But I do think that, I mean, I'll say one other thing about participatory budgeting. I think it's something that is a, it's a very sensible kind of campaign for progressives who are, if you want a progressive policy that's good in and of itself, that, that delivers goods and, and, and satisfies needs far better than what we have in the present, and one that foreshadows moving in the direction of an altogether better economy that in some sense embodies those principles and goals, um, then I think participatory budgeting is a particularly good and attractive campaign for various people to think about, you know, think about throwing, throwing themselves into. And one last thing I'll say is that the participatory budgeting um, in both Kerala and in and Brazil, it got such good press when it was sort of studied by academics that even the World Bank adopted it as something that they officially endorse. The World Bank officially favors programs moving countries and governments toward participatory budgeting, and they even use that word. Now, you can say that, yeah, well, this is, you know, they support it, but they don't really support it. Yeah, of course. But it's one of those ideas that was so good that even an institution that would have to be drug, you know, by its heels um, felt the need to say, well, gee, you know, this stuff's okay. In any case, that's, I, I, I do think the participatory budgeting is a very important thing for all of us to be I think it's going to play a very important role, um, both in a truly desirable economy of the future and in the process of getting us there, as the same time that it's going to be a very important way to meet people's needs in the here and now. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Colm asks another question. He asks, are you aware of any cooperative federations that might be open to participating in a participatory economy pilot? How could we approach pitching such a pilot to a co-op federation? Robin? Um, don't we have a funding application into some uh, co-ops and unions in Austria? You're talking to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you explain that? <laughs> yes, um, there is um, a number of us involved with the Participatory Economy Project. Um, have thought about trying to build our own participatory economy, or at least a, a prototype of it, probably involving computers, probably involving real humans, um, and have submitted a bid to um, a, a funding agency in Austria, of all places, to see if they will take it. We actually submitted the bid earlier that was rejected. We've resubmitted the bid, um, and we're waiting to hear back from them. So. Yeah, that might be the germination of something, the start of something big um, or something small, but it's something. So, yeah, in that respect, there is a little bit of activity on that front that we're involved with. There may be other things that other people are doing as well. Um, I mean, the other place where where I, I mean, I already described my experience in Venezuela and then my attempt to sort of come up with something rather along those lines um, that I was hopeful that, you know, could be tried in Venezuela, um, but it wasn't. And it wasn't because, you know, the government there, I mean, the, the government there has been unable to move forward on any sort of progressive agenda. They have, they have, they have been forced to go backward, have gone backward, 
So instead of instead of the instead of the initiatives that were originally launched expanding along the in the in the kinds of directions we're now talking about, instead what there's been is sort of a shrinking of even the beginnings. And that's all, I mean, in my view, that's all terribly unfortunate. And we can we can argue till the cows come home about who's to blame for all that. Um, certainly both Democratic and certainly Republican administrations in Washington, DC were of no help. <laughs> but I mean, that would be the other place where, and I, and I, I, I do think, I mean, again, the Lula government, you know, in in Brazil is going to probably be under even more constraints than he went when he first came to power, you know, and governed, you know, back a few decades ago. Um, but I do think particular. I mean, we should all we should all be looking there to see if and when and how um, they might be pursue they might be pursuing some of these initiatives some initiatives along the lines that you're asking about. Um, and I'm, I'm forever optimistic that, um, that, that, might, that, that we, might, we might find some very positive things there. Thank you. Um, and an anonymous attendee writes, is there a role for entrepreneurship in a participatory economy? Robin? That's a really good question. Um, Entrepreneurship is absolutely needed. What is entrepreneurship? It is new thinking about how to do something in the economy differently than it's been done. It's coming up with a new product line that consumers will be happier with. It's coming up with a new production process that uses less labor, uses less scarce resources, is more pleasant, you know, for the people who have to, you know, who have to do the production. So, I mean, new, I mean, we need innovation. And entrepreneurship is the name for the human activity of innovating so and I, and I think this is very important and I actually and I also think this is something that most most people who are positively inclined towards socialism I think correctly sense in one way or another that one of the failures of quote unquote 20th century socialism was that it proved to be lacking in entrepreneurship, the ability to innovate, even compared to its capitalist competitors. So I take this issue seriously. I think it's very important to learn from what led the 20th century socialist economies to be lacking in this respect, so the first thing is to recognize it's important. We want a desirable economy is one where entrepreneurship is going to flourish in the sense that entrepreneurship is creative new thinking about how to do things better in our economy. So we want an econ desirable economy, you know, is one that's that that is going to in which entrepreneurship is going to flourish. How do you make entrepreneurship flourish? Um, how do you reward entrepreneurship? And one of the things that I'll give you a very specific example. So what if we have a workers' council that proves to be um, particularly innovative? And, and as a result, um, they're making proposals um, that are easily accepted. And this, the, the social benefit to social cost ratio of their proposals and what they're doing is higher than in other workers' councils. Well, should they reap the benefits of that um, in terms of higher effort ratings? Well, one answer is yes. And that would be a more or less 
material reward for successful entrepreneurship, you know, to workers' councils that were more successful along those lines. Now, is there a problem with that? And what I've argued is there is a problem with that. That in some sense, it, it in some sense it's unfair. Um, and so you have a kind of dilemma which leads to a trade-off. If you give material rewards to successful entrepreneurship, workers' councils, whether it's more successful entrepreneurship, in some sense, you're violating your, your principle of reward according to efforts and sacrifices. Um, one question is, will it be necessary? Can we provide non-material rewards for successful entrepreneurship? And if so, wouldn't that be a better route to go, at least initially, until it proves to be inadequate? Um, and that would be my inclination. On the other hand, I mean, you will find in the book the recommendation that, well, that's a decision that people in a participatory economy will have to, will have to make for themselves if, if, if the situation arises. Whether they discuss if what would a, what would people in a participatory economy do if they came to the conclusion that like those centrally planned economies of the 20th century, their economy was just lagging with regard to innovativeness? Might they then want to make the decision that we're going to go ahead and provide material rewards for enterprises that seem you know that are, have proven to be more innovative? And my answer to that is they might have to do that. And if so, they should go ahead and do that. Um, on the other hand, if you take a, if you study technical change, um, what it turns out is that technical change usually, you know, is a much more complicated social process than just somebody sitting in their garage, you know, coming up with a new invention. Um, and therefore, um, one of the things that we've proposed is that industries, the you know, federation industries should sponsor, I mean, we should have, federa each federation industry, you know, should have its own resources for, you know, major innovation, studying major innovations. And the other thing we've proposed is that right now um, in capitalist economies, the only people, it, it, it's, only, it's only business that basically, you know, is control of innovation. And consumers really have none. Um, so we propose, well, in our economy, we have consumer federations as well as industry federations of workers' councils. And why wouldn't you want the consumer federations to have major funding for? They would simply ask for it as, a public good that they want. They want major funding for research into new product lines that consumers might like. Have the consumer federations in charge of innovation regarding, you know, creating new kinds of products and have the worker federations in charge of the funding for and the management of research facilities for innovation and work process. So that's that's a rather long answer. Sorry about that. that that's quite all right. Um, uh, in fact, that actually is the final question that has been posed in the Q&A. We thank everyone uh, who has participated, who has asked questions. Um, thought it was very useful. Um, and we're approaching the end of time. So unless anyone else has any current questions, you may want to get them in now in the few minutes. But otherwise, I think we will go ahead and wrap up the website of the Participatory Economy Project, which is online at participatoryeconomy.org. Um, it's there where you can sign up for a regular newsletter uh, with announcements of various activities and events and announcements of things, uh, as well as an online forum that you can sign in to discuss um, issues related to a participatory economy, pose questions, um, uh, dis uh, offer discussion uh, on matters re related to a participatory, a participatory economy and related issues. Um, so that's a resource there for people to sign up and join and participate in. Um, and the book that we've been talking about is A Participatory Economy. Robin Hanel is the author. 
Um, and the book is available now through AK Press online at akpress.org. We encourage everyone to buy a copy and buy several for all of your friends uh, and spread the word. Um, and uh, with that, we, we're, we're approaching time, so we will end it here. We thank everyone for joining in. Uh, we thank everyone for all the questions. Um, and we will see you online at participatoryeconomy.org or elsewhere um, and your various efforts. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, yeah, bye for now. Thank you, everybody.